This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on Africa News Tonight... The deals you've signed, the investments we've made together are concrete proof of the enduring commitment we're making to one another. That's U.S. President Joe Biden on commitments made at the Africa-U.S. Leaders Summit, demonstrating how the two sides are growing closer. Details coming up. Also, most political parties have called for a boycott of Tunisian elections Saturday. And French President Emmanuel Macron has praised Morocco's performance at the World Cup. We have these stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. U.S. President Joe Biden has told African leaders the world's success in the future depends largely on the continent. At the U.S.-Africa summit in Washington, Biden administration officials have told African counterparts the days of China monopolizing trade and investments on the continent are over. Biden said a new agreement with the African continental free trade area will give American companies access to $1.3 billion dollars. Three billion people and a market valued at almost three and a half trillion dollars. Darren Taylor reports. The Biden government's commitment to Africa stands in stark contrast to the Trump administration's attitude toward the continent, which was basically to ignore it, according to many analysts. My day job is the chairman, the executive chairman of the Pula Group, which is a U.S. based company. And we focus on investing in high-value opportunities on the continent. Charles Stiths, also former U.S. ambassador to Tanzania. And we think the countries like ours that bring something of significance, both in terms of capital, access to capital, and access to markets that are important to uh, Africa's development and the continent's future. He's also founder of the African Presidential Leadership Center, a South Africa-based nonprofit that researches contemporary trends and developments in Africa. Stith says it specializes in connecting former and current African leaders with political and business counterparts in America. Africa is still in recovery as it relates to the impact of COVID on its economies. Aid is going to be important to that recovery, but even more important is how Africa participates more fully in global supply chains that were broken during COVID and showed evidence of creaking and cracking even before COVID. Stith says the U.S. is going to play a major role in repairing some of that damage, especially with investment from its private sector. American corporate giants like General Electric have announced large deals with African countries at the summit. Stith says the event's already having a positive impact on small and big business in Africa. Uh, It's a tremendous opportunity for the continent. I met with one gentleman who just shipped a container of uh, cashew nuts, which had been completely processed and packaged in Tanzania. That's huge in terms of the impact that that kind of beneficiation can have for Tanzania's growth and development. He says a big talking point at the summit is how Africa can participate in the green revolution happening in the energy sector. Right now, we're seeing more done in the way of exploration of fossil fuels on the continent than has been done at any time. But, you know, the governor of California... The the state where my company is based just announced that in 2035, every new car sold in the state of California will have to be either an e-vehicle or a hybrid. So it means that the days of fossil fuels are a number. So how Africa begins to position itself for this green transition might be more important than anything else on the agenda for discussion. Stith has seen quite a few African leaders buzzing around Capitol Hill, with their focus on one American politician in particular. For the first time in history, an African-American congressman, Hakeem Jeffries, is now the Democratic minority leader. 
And should the Democrats take over the House in the next election in uh, 2024, Congressman Jeffries will become, in all probability, the Speaker of the House, which is the third most powerful position in Washington. So, says Stiff, while the U.S. tries to position itself as Africa's strongest and best partner going forward, African leaders are astute enough to also play a long-term gain game. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Lemma Wildesandbet is Chair Professor of Finance at the University of Maryland and between 2013 and 2018 was the Executive Director and CEO of the African Research Consortium, the largest and oldest economic research and training network in Africa. He tells me the U.S. is far from new to Africa. He says that over the years it has built a variety of economic pillars in the continent that are the center of the U.S.-Africa summit. So Africa is uh, the next frontier and it is globally getting attention. And the U.S. definitely cannot be left behind and it has instruments and capabilities built over the years to actually do it. And uh, then, of course, uh, Africa matters uh, for the U.S. as well. Africa has a myriad of challenges, you know, issues of food security, you know, the health, uh, agricultural productivity issues, and uh, low-growth poverty. Although, uh, on the buy side, uh, it used to grow uh, pretty fast. Uh, Seven of the fastest-growing countries in the world were from Africa pre-COVID. So there are tremendous opportunities for growth. The question is, how do we get this to the next level? And one of the uh, things that Africa did, which actually got the attention of the globe, including the U.S., is the establishment of the largest free trade area in terms of population, 54 countries, basically trying to integrate a market in labor, in service and trade and commodities. And this is going to be an incredible potential for building a vast market for the benefit of the world. And for, for Africa, a partnering with the U.S. will actually help in speeding up the implementation of the uh, trade agreement. Yeah. Can we talk about the transformation of U.S.-Africa partnership? Yeah, so the transformation, in order to understand the transformation, we need to understand what the U.S. has done in the past. And we have uh, initiatives like uh, Prosper Africa, which is heavily dependent on the involvement of private sector. You have Power Africa, you have the PEPFAR. So moving forward, uh, what is getting a lot more attention in a transformative way is the role of the Africa diaspora and also the role of the private sector. It's not just government to government, but also creating opportunities, capabilities, both in Africa and the U.S., so that uh, at a grassroots level, at a civil society level, at the private sector level, there be mutuality of economic benefits. So, and of course, the other thing in the background is uh, the region has become a very powerful uh, voting bloc, <laughs> although they are not exercising their voting uh, rights as much as uh, they should. And that, that is also uh, getting a lot of attention. And, and at this summit, uh, President Biden confirmed that uh, he would be pushing for, uh, for the uh, submission of AU as part of the G20. So there are, you know that there are two powerful forums. One is G7. These are the most advanced uh, economies of the world. And then that got expanded into G20, inclusive of G7. So the only country in Africa which is part of the G20, the expanded group is South Africa. None of the other countries are members of G20. So G20 is a very, very important forum. For instance, when the global financial crisis occurred, in fact, that's when it became uh, very uh, visible, is uh, they came together in partnership, had conversations about the global financial order. And Africans were not at the table. They may be invited at gust, but they are not at the decision-making table. So there are a lot of things, especially on the economic front, that actually affect Africa, but debated and decided upon by this club of, of, uh, of uh, 20 countries. Uh, by the way, uh, they say, okay, what happens if AU is going to be 21? It's already 21 because EU is a member of the G20 club as well.
Professor, uh, eight years ago uh, under President Obama, there was the first summit and uh, you were involved in that as well. What differences do you see from uh, what happened eight years ago and situations right now as far as the summit is concerned? You know, what, uh, what interests me most uh, with this summit, uh, because it's the consultative nature that they employ. And one of the things that was quite an awakening for me is that there was a bipartisan, bipartisan Republican and Democratic support for this emerging uh, Africa-U.S. economic uh, partnership. That's Lema Weldesemba, Chair, Professor of Finance at the University of Maryland. He spoke to me from Washington, D.C. U.S. President Joe Biden yesterday told the dozens of African leaders gathered in Washington the United States is all in on Africa's future. In a speech to leaders gathered for the Africa-U.S. Leaders Summit, Biden described billions of dollars in promised government funding and private businesses investment to help the continent in health, infrastructure, business, and technology. The United States is signing a historic memorandum of understanding with the new African Continental Free Trade Area Secretary. This MOU will unlock new opportunities for trade and investment between our countries and bring Africa and the United States even closer than ever. This enormous opportunity, an enormous opportunity for Africa's future, and the United States wants to help make those opportunities real. He went on to say that under the Memorandum of Understanding, the U.S. would particularly encourage working with small and medium-sized businesses and those owned by women or members of underserved communities. He also said the U.S. will help develop the transportation infrastructure needed to make trade easier among African nations. In the first such summit since 2014, Biden announced $55 $55 billion in investment over three years to address African food security, climate change, and development issues. He said that money was just the beginning. All of you, all of you, the deals you've signed, the investments we've made together are concrete proof of the enduring commitment we're making to one another, government to government, business to business, people to people. The most important, and this is just the beginning, there's so much more we can do together and that we'll do together. The three-day summit wraps up today. For more on the gathering, please check out voaafrica.com and be sure to catch all your favorite VOA programs. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Tunisia is holding its legislative elections Saturday with more than 1,000 candidates. Most political parties have called for a boycott, saying they believe their role has been greatly reduced since President Kais Saeed changed the constitution after he took full control of the government last July. VOA's Angie Omar discussed how the elections can be effective after, after Saeed eliminated the legislative powers in the constitution with Sarah Yerkes, a senior fellow in Carnegie's Middle East program. Her research focuses on Tunisia's political, economic, and security developments, as well as state-society relations in the Middle East and North Africa. I agree that these elections are really largely meaningless, and they are really set up to bring to power a toothless legislature. The 2020 Constitution severely limits the power of the parliament. In this Constitution, President Saeed is above the law. He cannot be impeached. He cannot be removed from office. And he also maintains the ability to pass his own decree laws and to veto parliament's work, making much of what they do rather irrelevant. Additionally, you know, one of the things that's quite odd about this Constitution is that he has created a second chamber of parliament, the National Council of Regions and Districts. And we know very little about this body at this time. So Tunisians are going to the polls to elect a legislature that will only be sort of half of the governing legislature, yet they don't even know what that other body is going to look like. They don't know what the separation of powers will be between these two bodies. So this whole process has really just been troubling from the start. Tunisian President Kaiser Saeed released the new electoral law on September 15th with new rules that will govern the December legislative elections and provide him with broad powers. What do you make of that? 
Since he seized power in his self-coup back on July 25th, 2021, Saeed has really steadily chipped away at Tunisia's decade of democratic progress. And this electoral law is just the sort of latest codification of his anti-democratic agenda. The law, you know, had made it really, really onerous for people to run for office, which is one of the reasons that we've seen several districts that are up for election on Saturday with only one or in some cases zero candidates, which is really just a remarkable situation. But it also severely limited the role of political parties. Political parties have long been Saeed's enemy, one of his main targets, which is one of the main reasons why a lot of these parties are boycotting in the final place. Um, but the, also the law, you know, really ran counter to Saeed's own supposed anti-corruption agenda. One of the things that was quite strange about this law is that it eliminated the public financing of campaigns, which means that only people who have the means to run, you know, mostly wealthy individuals or people who can, who are well connected are able to run for office, which is completely counter to sort of Saeed's mantra that he's supposed to be a man of the people and supporting the people, taking away the sort of equalizing factor of allowing public financing is really just an odd move on his part. So overall, the law has really been troubling in many, many ways. And I think that's borne out in the fact that, again, you don't have, you have certain districts where no one is even running, in part because of the onerous challenges to run, but also just in part because people don't think this is a useful exercise. Tunisia is also in the grip of a deep financial crisis, which has resulted in recurrent shortages of basic products such as sugar milk and rice. How much do you think that will add up to the inflation in the country? So Tunisia has been experiencing really a growing financial crisis for many months. And that inflation is really brutal today. And it's leaving many Tunisians unable to pay for basic goods. We were seeing long lines of queues for petrol, for bread, for other staples in the grocery stores. But I think what's really important to remember is that President Said has really done nothing to address this crisis. And many of his policies, in fact, exacerbated the financial difficulties that many Tunisians are facing. So the constitution that he designed puts all of the power into his own hands. So he has the ability to make changes. He has the ability to take advantage of this really unique situation in order to push through troubling economic reform or reforms that have been risky to other parties in the past. Because he has all the power in his own hands, he doesn't have to rely on a parliament to sort of agree to the measures he would need to take. If he wanted to, if he had that desire, he could push through various economic reforms to try to help the country move forward. His policies have also really lost the confidence of international donors. So President Saeed, you know, he has a tremendous amount of political capital, but he spent all of that capital on creating a new constitution, on a new political system that no one in Tunisia was demanding and ignores the drastic economic challenges that are facing his constituents. That was Sarah Yerkes, a senior fellow in Carnegie's uh, Middle East program, speaking from Washington, D.C. with VOA's Angie Omar. The head of the World Health Organization says his uncle was killed by Eritrean troops in the northern Tigray region. The French news agency AFP says Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus told the UN news conference yesterday that his uncle, who was about his own age, 57, was among more than 50 people in his village who had been killed. The WHO leader said he was so shaken that he nearly cancelled the news conference. He added, I hope the peace agreement will hold and this madness would stop. Ethiopian and Tigran rebels signed a ceasefire on November 2nd after two years of fighting that had displaced more than two million people. All parties in the conflict have been accused of committing atrocities. Botswana's government says rural communities have earned five million dollars since last year from the proceeds of elephant hunting. Conservationists object to the practice, but local officials say the hunts are necessary to reduce human wildlife conflict. The annual activity attracts hunters from overseas who pay huge sums to shoot elephants. Moki Ed- Mokandisi Dube reports from Abrone, Botswana. Acting Minister of Environment and Tourism, Sitabelo Mutteganele says communities are benefiting following the lifting of a five-year hunting ban. Hunting was reinstated in 2019, following a five-year moratorium after extensive stakeholder consultation. This allowed communities to generate considerable revenues amounting to 50 million ula over two years for their development projects. Most of the revenue is from international hunters who pay up to $50,000 to shoot a single elephant. Botswana Wildlife Producers Association Chief Executive Isaac Theophilus says more could be done to ensure communities benefit from wildlife resources. 
communities can still make more from from hunting the problem right now is that communities only depend on either selling their hunting quotas subleasing uh, some of the areas that have been uh, allocated to them in order to gain more from hunting communities have to explore other avenues of trying to raise funds uh, by investing them the 50 million that they have accrued uh, into income generating activities Botswana's growing elephant population at more than 130,000 has created conflict with humans as the animals often trample crops, injure or kill people. But elephant expert Keith Lindsay says elephant hunting could hurt the species breeding patterns. The biggest male elephants are the ones that contribute most to the population in terms of uh, survival and mating success. And their genes are actively selected and chosen by female elephants. They prefer mating with the biggest males. By taking away those big males, you're damaging the population's genetic structure and sur- uh, survival chances in the future. Meanwhile, Minister Mutuganile says the government has distributed nearly 400 wild animals to small-scale farmers to ensure locals have a stake in agrotourism. Government made a deliberate decision to support startup ventures for Botswana, for Botswana who showed interest and met the requisite criterion for keeping of gain in plowing fields. Those who qualified were assisted with animals of various species such as impala, gemsbok, eland and zebra. To date, 277 had applied and 251 approved and 67 provided with seed stock totaling 377 animals. At a recent meeting of parties to CITES, the 1963 Treaty to Protect Endangered Species, some African countries tried to present a proposal seeking to ban trophy hunting in Botswana and other southern African elephant range states. The attempt was unsuccessful and elephant hunting will continue in Botswana for the foreseeable future. Mkondisi Dube for VOA News, Haboroni, Botswana. French President Emmanuel Macron attended Wednesday night's France-Morocco World Cup semi-final in Qatar and afterwards praised the Moroccans for their historic run to the last four of football's premier event. Macron said Morocco has a great team and he saluted the North African squad for playing a beautiful game at the World Cup. He also said he wants to tell the Moroccan people of our friendship. Morocco was ruled by France from 1912 to 1956 and the semi-final had political and emotional resonance for both nations. Macron and French fans are now looking forward to Sunday's World Cup final against Argentina. It's a matchup that features Paris Saint-Germain superstars Kylian Mbappé of France and Lionel Messi Messi of Argentina. Macron comments uh, on Messi. He's a great player when he plays in Paris, but I prefer him in Paris than his national team. So uh, we will do our best now. We have a lot of respect for, for, for this team. This is a wonderful one, but I think uh, the French team is well prepared. We have um, very experienced and very young players, and I, I think the mix of bo- both is absolutely incredible. And um, I'm very confident in this chemistry, and I think this is a team with a, a lot of willingness, generosity, and uh, it will have 68 million people backing them, and I will be part of them. That was French President Emmanuel Macron, who is expected to attend Sunday's World Cup final between defending champion France and Argentina in Qatar. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhibe.